A 2,000-year Roman Catholic Masonic conspiracy, including 911, the JFK assassination, and the Holocaust? There's a geomancy laid out in the streets of Rome that has been in place since before the time of Christ that takes the form in precise regular geometry. This geometry has its foundation in some of the most ancient roadways and buildings in Rome that Emperor Constantine the Great and subsequent popes, most notably Pope Sixtus V, built upon over the centuries. In modern times, evidence points to Freemasons as having picked up the torch, extending the unmistakable geomancy in the New World that connects what are arguably the most important, dark events shaping our current era. More mysteriously, this human geography connects to the very structure of the planet with continental and extreme topographic features lining up. Whether conspiracy or something far more mysterious, the geometry is undeniable. This tale begins with background on the most important churches of Christianity that are connected by being built by Constantine the Great, one of the most pivotal figures in Christianity for his role in legalizing Christianity and accelerating the Roman Catholic Church. The first church we'll look at is the most important from this video's perspective because it anchors the baseline of Rome's geometry. The Basilica of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, one of the seven pilgrimage churches of Rome, consecrated in 325 AD by Constantine the Great, is in Jerusalem because talismanic soil brought from Jerusalem covered the floor and is part of the church to this day in a chapel below the altar. This basilica houses relics of Christ's crucifixion, including three pieces of the true cross and nails used in the ritual. This church is unique in that it is the only one of two places St. Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great, enshrined the true cross after she discovered it at the site where Jesus was crucified and entombed. The other site where she enshrined the true cross is at the actual crucifixion and burial site of Jesus, which now lays under the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the holiest site in Christianity, built by Constantine. In addition to this Jerusalem church, Constantine built Old St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican, the precursor to the greatest church in Christianity and one of its holiest sites. St. Peter was the first pope and his tomb lies beneath the high altar of this most important church. It's a major papal basilica and one of the seven pilgrimage churches. He also built the Archbasilica of St. John Lateran, the Pope's Cathedral that ranks superior to all others in the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, it is also a major papal basilica and another of the seven pilgrimage churches. Given the Masonic connections highlighted in the course of this video, I have to mention that Constantine ruled in 333 AD. Repeating threes are important to Masons as evidenced by their most important George Washington Masonic Memorial being 333 feet tall and 333 kilometers from the Masonic Statue of Liberty. 33 is the highest degree attainable in Scottish Rites Freemasonry. The first 32 degrees are obtainable by merit and ritual alone, while the 33rd is reserved only for the chosen ones. Of course, Christ was 33 years old when he was crucified. Now we'll introduce another character, the protagonist of this tale, Sixtus V. In his five-year papacy, Sixtus V undertook a redesign of Rome that has been called one of the most remarkable design processes in history. He opened up lengths of road, brought in new aqueduct water, erected four ancient obelisks, including the three largest standing Egyptian obelisks in the world, and more. His plan has been followed with few exceptions since it was put into play over 400 years ago. His redesign created most of the amazing geomancy described in this video. Before unpacking this geomancy of the baseline anchored at the Basilica of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, I want to highlight a couple of alignments created by Constantine the Great when he was legalizing Christianity because of how it connects him to Sixtus V over 1200 years separating their reigns. The largest obelisk of the four Sixtus V erected stands in front of the Lateran Palace and lies exactly on a line between the tombs of Jesus 
and of St. Peter and the churches Constantine built to enshrine them. This alignment also passes over the Marcus Aurelius statue at the center of Campidoglio Square, the center of Rome since the very beginning. It is the only fully surviving bronze statue of a pre-Christian Roman emperor and exists today only because people of the Middle Ages mistakenly thought it was a likeness of Constantine and didn't melt it down for some other purpose. Before standing at the center of Michelangelo's famous square, it stood for 800 years where the Lateran obelisk now stands on a pedestal provided by Pope Sixtus IV in the 8th century, marking the alignment 400 years after it was set up by Constantine. It is about 330 tons, according to Wikipedia, which I note because of the 33. Notice also that one of the roads Sixtus V opened up to the Colosseum runs along this line. That the largest ancient Egyptian obelisk is standing here makes sense when you consider the Lateran Palace was the principal residence of the Pope for about a thousand years, beginning in the 4th century. It further makes sense when you understand that the palace is attached to the Archbasilica of St. John Lateran. Constantine the Great created the Archbasilica about the same time he created St. Peter's Basilica and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, establishing the alignment between the three that Sixtus V later accentuated with the largest obelisk. The Lateran obelisk was moved as a pair to Alexandria with another that is now known as the Obelisk of Theodosius. The two were separated from here with the Lateran being brought to Rome and the Obelisk of Theodosius to Constantinople not long after Constantine's city was dedicated in 330 AD. I mention this because the Lateran Obelisk is again part of an important alignment being this time from the temple of Debod to the obelisk of Theodosius. This temple was saved from the rising waters of the Aswan Dam by being moved to Madrid in the early 70s. The Lateran obelisk is very near to being at a halfway point between the temple and the obelisk of Theodosius. The temple is aligned. This illustrates that they are still marking this ancient geomancy in modern times. Back to the Geomancy of Rome, I want to mention the alignment from the Lateran Obelisk through the Flaminio Obelisk passes within two kilometers of Stonehenge because it plays into the geometry later in the video. The Flaminio Obelisk was also erected by Sixtus V in Piazza del Popolo and is the third largest ancient Egyptian obelisk in the world after the Lateran and the Vaticano, both raised by Sixtus V. Given the dark nature of the events this geomancy connects, it's worth mentioning that the Flaminio obelisk oversaw executions in the square for hundreds of years after it was erected. Returning to the Basilica of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem will establish a baseline from which the majority of the geometry in this video follows by setting a line from the basilica's front doors to the exact spot where JFK was assassinated. Pope Sixtus V opened up streets along 3.3 kilometers of this alignment as part of his grand redesign. The section that is exactly aligned runs from the Basilica of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem to the Basilica of St. Mary Major and is 5,555 feet long, which is 66,666 inches. Since obelisks have played such a big role so far, I need to mention that the Masonic Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., the tallest obelisk and granite structure in the world, resonates with this length of road Sixtus V opened up by being 555.5 feet tall, which is, of course, 6,666 inches. At the JFK end, there is 4.6 kilometers of Dallas Street that is very close to being aligned, off by about 17 one-hundredths of a degree. This JFK line in Rome has an incredible wealth of symbolism. It has two of the seven pilgrimage churches, one of which, the Basilica of St. Mary Major, is one of only four papal basilicas. These major basilicas are special in that they enjoy extraterritorial status to the Vatican, much like foreign embassies of countries. Specifically, this line passes through the Sistine Chapel in St. Mary Major, now, this isn't the famous Sistine Chapel at the Vatican that you're likely familiar with, but is instead named for and built by Sixtus V and houses his burial tomb.
It passes one of the first Marian columns, an ancient column from the Basilica of Constantine, the largest building in the Forum, that was brought here and topped with a bronze statue of the Virgin Mother and Child. This line passes three ancient obelisks, including the Esquiline obelisk raised by Sixtus V, of only 13 in Rome, and terminates close to another at the JFK end. The one the line runs exactly through is the Salustiano, which is an Aurelian obelisk erected by Pope Pius VI and modeled after the Flaminio raised by Sixtus V, also along the line. Pope Pius VI also erected the Quirinal, which marks another base alignment later in this video. It runs through the famous four fountains created by Sixtus V, pivotal to geometry later in this video, and passes directly over the statue of Neptune in Piazza del Popolo. It passes within 40 meters of the Triton fountain, where Triton is Neptune's son, and together are important as controllers of the earth and the seas. Since this alignment goes directly through the Neptune statue, I want to draw attention to his signature trident. The statue resides in Piazza del Popolo, which has three streets leading off the square, known as Tridante. Follow the alignment and we see there's another trident in the Rome grid and travel to Dallas to see that there's also one at the site of JFK's assassination. The 911 Memorial Museum, built between the tower's footprints, was actually designed to accommodate two seven-story tridents from the wreckage of the towers and has a third trident on display inside the museum where the pulverized remains of 1,113 victims lie close by. These twin tridents that create a symbolic link to Dallas line up with a diagonal across the north reflecting pool. Run a line across the other diagonal to see that it goes to the spot where JFK was shot. From 911, we are brought back to the Piazza di Popolo through the fountain mirroring Neptune on the opposite side of the square on the way to the Mausoleum of St. Helena. This fountain, Rome between the Tiber and the Anini, features the goddess Rome and the iconic Capitoline wolf between her feet. It also features personifications of the Anian River that flows east of Rome into the Tiber River and of the Tiber itself. Consider that Sixtus V, four fountains, also feature these same personifications in two of the four fountains. This means that our lines from 911 and JFK, linked symbolically by tridents on the U.S. end, are linked symbolically here in Rome by the parallel statues straddling both alignments on their way to St. Helena buildings. The Mausoleum of St. Helena was built by Constantine in 330, originally for himself, but later assigned to his mother, who died a couple years earlier. It's a curious location far outside the protective Aurelian walls of Rome and its most important memorials. The nearest gate is over three kilometers from the mausoleum. While convenient for our geomancy, it's unusual for such an important memorial to be so far from the heart of Rome. Looking down at the ruins of the mausoleum shows how the innermost circular wall has a radius of 33.3 feet. Its design may remind you of Stonehenge, and overlaying the famous megalithic circle shows it is indeed a close fit. The fact that the diameter of Stonehenge's sarsen stones is acknowledged as 33 meters, and that its outer earthen feature has a circumference of 333 meters, suggests that the similarity between the two sites may not be a coincidence. Taking this as a cue, I found that a line from the mausoleum through Stonehenge went to Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore is such a famous site that few know is deeply Masonic. From the man the mountain is named after, to the state governor at the time, to the lawmakers and financiers that facilitated it, to the stonemasons that carved it, and to the subject of the carving, most everyone is a mason. It's reasonable to say that this is the most prominent esoteric Masonic edifice in the world, the biggest secret in plain sight, so to speak. 
With Mount Rushmore identified in this way, it's reasonable to ask about its relationship to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre because that too was built by Constantine to hold St. Helena's true cross. Before we explore this alignment, understand that it was here where nine knights first gathered to found the Knights Templar on Christmas Day in 1119. While denied by some experts, the myth that the Knights Templar went underground and re-emerged as Freemasons is persistent enough to not ignore considering the other end of the line is anchored by Masonic R Mount Rushmore. It turns out that a line between the two goes directly over the infamous Auschwitz death camp of the Holocaust. Move the line a half a kilometer to Temple Mount, the holiest site in Judaism and in Freemasonry, where Solomon's Temple stood, and see that it passes directly over the so-called Death Gate, where Holocaust trains would enter to deliver the damned. We'll return to Auschwitz in a bit and see how it's further connected to Roman Geomancy and 911. With the Masonic connection of Mount Rushmore to Stonehenge guiding the way, we'll define a line from Stonehenge, which is 33 meters across, to the George Washington Masonic Memorial, which is 333 feet tall. As Mount Rushmore is perhaps the prominent esoteric Masonic Memorial, the George Washington Masonic Memorial is the most important exoteric example. It has a large compass and square out front identifying it as such. The line passes through the heart of New York City, very close to the Statue of Liberty designed and built by Freemason Frederick Auguste Bartholdi. Naturally, Lady Liberty rises from a pedestal that had its cornerstone laid in full Masonic ceremony. Examining this arrangement a bit closer, a line exactly 333 kilometers from the Masonic Memorial through the statue's torch ends at a point precisely 333 meters from the torch. Define a circle based on this, and see that it's tangent to the Stonehenge to Masonic Memorial line. Plot out a circle of 666 meter radius around the twin tridents at the 911 Memorial Museum, and it too touches the Stonehenge line at a tangent. Recall that a line from the twin tridents at the 911 Memorial to St. Helena's Mausoleum passes through the Goddess of Rome statue in Piazza del Popolo. Seeing that the Goddess of Rome shares features with the Statue of Liberty, take the line instead from Lady Liberty's torch. This makes it pass almost exactly over where the 666 meter circle intersects the Stonehenge to Masonic Memorial line. With the Statue of Liberty's torch being marked as important and with Auschwitz appearing in the mix, I asked where a line goes between the two and found that it passes within just a few meters of the twin tridents in the atrium of the entrance to the 911 Memorial Museum. Draw in the projected geometry across the diagonal of the North Tower and along the west edge of the South Tower and you see geometry is octagonal. Draw the mirror octagon and the overlap of the two creates a parallelogram centered on our Liberty Torch to Auschwitz line. A line through the other axis goes to Mount Everest where we see hexagonal geometry in the bedrock centered on the parallelogram axis. When considering the Holocaust, you can't ignore the prominence of the Anne Frank story about the young girl who lived in a secret annex avoiding capture by the Nazis for two years until right near the end of the Holocaust. Her story ends with her spending two weeks at Auschwitz after she was captured before being transferred to Bergen-Belsen, where she died. On June 12, 2017, on what would have been Anne Frank's 88th birthday, and 13 days before the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, a chestnut tree sapling was dedicated in Liberty Park that overlooks the 911 memorial site in New York City. This sapling came from the famous Anne Frank tree that she watched and took comfort in during her hiding time. Taking a cue from Auschwitz, we'll run a line from the Masonic Statue of Liberty's torch once more, but this time to the site of the now dead Anne Frank tree in Amsterdam. It passes almost exactly over the center of the Museum of Jewish Heritage pyramidal Holocaust hexagon, 
and within 14 meters of the daughter sapling. Taking an overview of the site, we realized that the Holocaust sapling is precisely aligned with the southwest corners of the Twin Tower footprints. Furthermore, overlaying a mirror image of the Giza Plateau shows that the spacing between the three is a fractal of the spacing between the three main pyramids. This alignment of the Giza pyramids plays an important role later in this video. We return to Rome to see how urban design by numerous popes over the millennia forms the regular geometry that further links the events we've been looking into. If we overlay a hexagon on Rome aligned exactly with this baseline, we see that it can be positioned so that one of its bisectors lines up precisely with one tine of the trident via repetta and anchors the hexagon in position. Via repetta is an ancient avenue in Rome running along the Tiber River since about the first century BC according to Wikipedia. This map has Rome's streets as they were in 475 AD and clearly shows the road following its modern course. Looking closer at the JFK baseline, a short section of road also closely follows the ancient Roman grid for some 470 meters where it crosses another ancient road, Alta Semita, suggesting that this implied hexagon has existed at least since the year the Talmud was created. An echo of that road exists today and the intersection with Alta Semita was important enough for Sixtus V that he marked it with the famous four fountains as mentioned. We'll return to this critical intersection later and explore how it anchors more regular geometry. The hexagon size is set by keeping the corner anchored at Piazza di Popolo and then expanding until it, one of its bisectors passes exactly through the center of the Pyramid of Cestius. While this may seem like a somewhat arbitrary choice, consider that it being built around 12 BC has it existing at the same time as one of the hexagon's base roads, Via Repetta. They say it is one of the best preserved ancient buildings in Rome, indicating its value to rulers over the millennia. It also happens to be implicated with repeating threes by being almost exactly 3,333 miles from the North Pole. Different engravings of the seven pilgrimage churches from before and after Sixtus V's handiwork all make a point of including the Pyramid of Cestius. Fixing the hexagon in this way, notice that another edge runs through the Vatican. More specifically, it runs directly through the other famous Sistine Chapel, which sees over 5 million people per year pass underneath Michelangelo's frescoes. This time, the chapel is named after Pope Sixtus IV, who built the chapel. The edge also runs directly through the Apostolic Palace, the official residence of the sitting Pope. This building is particularly noteworthy because it is also known as the Palace of Sixtus V, who initiated its construction of its most recent version. Given that both Jerusalem and the Masons have been connected to this tale, it's perhaps not surprising that the Sistine Chapel has the same dimensions as Solomon's Temple as stated in the Old Testament, given how important it is to Judaism and Freemasonry. Another consequence of this sizing by the Pyramid of Cestius is that now a bisector runs to the other Sistine Chapel in the Basilica of St. Mary Major that we've already seen sits on the hexagon's edge. This much less famous chapel was created by Sixtus V and serves as his burial tomb. It's worth noting that the Basilica of St. Mary Major was built by Pope Sixtus III, who is the Pope from 432 AD to 440 AD. Recall that Sixtus V opened up a connection between the most important Lateran obelisk and the Basilica of St. Mary Major as part of his redesign. If we move the terminus of this line to the Rome hexagon apex at his Sistine Chapel, we can see that the obelisk is centered in a hexagonal fractal of our existing geometry. This smaller hexagon perfectly inscribes a circle of 666 meter radius and the larger one of 77,777 inches. This sets up an amazing symmetry with the two lengths of road that Sixtus V opened up along the JFK alignment. 
The 77,777 inch circle comes tangent to the 777 meter stretch of road from the center of the Four Fountains intersection to the Salustiano obelisk, while the 666 meter radius circle comes tangent to the 66,666 inch stretch of road from the Basilica of the Holy Cross to St. Mary Major. Returning to the alignment between the Lateran and Flaminio obelisk, observe how it runs up a street of the Tridante via del Babuino, while the first two streets off Piazza del Popolo follow existing ancient Roman roads, the third only goes back to the 13th century and was given a new aspect and name by Pope Clement VII in 1525, 60 years before Sixtus V raised the obelisks. If we now take a line from the Flaminio obelisk to the Pyramid of Cestius, it's at an exact pentagram angle to the Flaminio to Lateran line. Taking this as a cue, create a pentagram with apex on the Pyramid of Cestius with size and orientation defined by the Flaminio to Cestius line. With this configuration, a projection along one leg of the pentagram goes exactly to Stonehenge. Turning back on the hexagon we first established shows that this pentagram is within 0.13 degrees of being aligned and three of its bisectors inter intersect the hexagon at edge midpoints indicating the correlation in size. You may have noticed earlier that the alignment to Stonehenge from the Lateran obelisk through the Flaminio obelisk actually passes through an irregular hexagonal patch of forest. Take an image of this hexagonal forest to Rome, overlay it on our JFK hexagon, and orient it to the Lateran to Flaminio line that led us to the forest hexagon in the first place. We see that the edge that is closest to Stonehenge when in situ is aligned with an edge parallel to the JFK baseline, showing that the hexagonal forest encodes the Rome hexagon. We return to the Four Fountains intersection and its ancient crossroad to the JFK baseline. Sixtus V valued this road as evidenced by the fact that he had the grade of the road leveled by up to four feet in some places, so you'd be able to see along the length to Porta Pia, commissioned by Pius IV and finished in 1561. Taking a line from Porta Pia through the ancient Roman Curinel obelisk, erected in its current position, by Pope Pius VI in 1786, continues on to intersect the center of the JFK hexagon. As mentioned, he also erected the Salustiano obelisk atop the Spanish banks, meaning that he placed two of the 13 ancient obelisks on geometry baselines established by Sixtus V centuries after his reign. This forms the baseline for our final Roman geomancy. Looking down at the intersection of our two baselines, we can see that the facades of the four fountains form a skewed octagon if connected. This intersection is at least 1500 years old as this 475 AD map shows. Taking this as a cue, we'll use the baseline to orient an octagon to the Roman street grid. Next, we'll increase its side length until the south edge lines up exactly with the Pyramid of Cestius. It's remarkable that the position of this ancient pyramid sets the size of all three of these Rome geometries. Sizing and orienting the octagon in this way has some incredible geomantic consequences. The most obvious is that the center bisector of the octagon aligning with the Vaticano obelisk in St. Peter's Square erected by Sixtus V as we've seen. The north and southwest edges also align with the north and south fountains that flank the Vaticano. Furthermore, the central bisector running to the Vaticano obelisk sets up an axis of Rome's most important human geography points, including the Lateran Palace and the Archbasilica of St. John Lateran, the Colosseum, the Forum, where the ruins of the Grand Basilica of Constantine the Great is aligned, and Capitoline Hill. The Basilica was one of the most impressive buildings in the Forum and was the last of the great civilian basilicas to be built there. The line runs just meters from where the colossal statue of Constantine stood. Notably, it passes within 13 meters of Fontana di Pizzazza de Alicoli, commissioned by Sixtus V. 
This unassuming fountain, just off the octagon bisector, gains its importance by being at the exact center of a circle through both the Lateran and Vaticano obelisks and the octagonal geometry that we've been looking at. Notice that the octagon has one apex defined by North Oak Fountain and JFK hexagon edge, and also one defined by South Fountain and pentagram leg of the Fulminio obelisk to Pyramid of Cestius. A line from the hexagon center through the octagon center runs to the front door of the Basilica of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem, connecting the geometry back to the baseline anchor and creating perhaps the most important alignment. Project this line around the world and it passes through Uluru. Uluru, also known as Ayers Rock, is the famous Australian monolith in the middle of Australia's outback. It is known as an earth shocker of the planet's ley line system, and the aboriginals recognize it as a major node in their song line network that they have traditionally followed on extensive walkabouts for tens of thousands of years. It is well known as a power spot and happens to have an area given as 3.33 square kilometers. This unlikely geometric configuration produces an astounding coincidence. The angle between the two holy cross lines is only two-tenths of a degree off from being that of the pyramidal atop the Masonic Washington Monument, as calculated from measurements given by the U.S. Park Service. The bisector of this pyramidal runs to the northeast edge of the Palace of Sixtus V, almost exactly through the famous Pantheon and former site of the ancient Temple of Isis. The Temple of Isis is noteworthy because, because it had many ancient obelisks erected there, up to ten according to a topographical dictionary of ancient Rome. These obelisks were moved to different locations around Rome, to private locations, and to different cities. Four of Rome's eight ancient Egyptian obelisks, and probably one of Rome's five ancient Roman obelisks, were here, meaning this site originally had five of the thirteen ancient obelisks existing today in Rome. Four other obelisk fragments exist that are from the site, and a fifth is probably also from here. This is an incredible concentration of obelisk symbolism at the Isis Temple in the middle of the pyramidal, considering that the current so-called enemy of the New World Order is known as Isis and is being fought under the oversight of the Masonic obelisk. It must be mentioned that this bisector runs within 25 meters of another fountain of Neptune in Piazza Navoa, where the Agonalis obelisk stands. This square also features the Moor fountain at the opposite end that has four tritons. Pantheon comes from the Greek Pantheion, meaning temple of every god. It is one of the best preserved of all ancient Roman buildings, in large part because it has been in continuous use throughout its history. Consider that to be a mason, you must believe in one god, no matter the nature of that god. This could lead to an interpretation of the pantheon being a Masonic temple of every one god, and its position being at the center of the pyramidal projection would make some sense. There's a plaque over the door of the left entrance to the pantheon that features imagery evocative of the Masonic compass and square, further hinting at this site's esoteric nature. The side elevation of the Pantheon shows that it encodes squaring of the circle geometry, where the circumference of the circle equals the perimeter of the square, a classic application of the Masonic compass and square. This is highly significant because the relationship between the base perimeter and height of the Great Pyramid, the relative size of the Earth and the Moon, and the relationship between the blue stones and sarsen stones of Stonehenge all encode the same geometry. We've already seen that Rome's geomancers mark Stonehenge, but the Great Pyramid was also valued as evidenced by the most important Campidoglio square being aligned. In a similar way to how the Basilica of the Holy Cross connects Uluru and the JFK assassination by acting as a talisman at the intersection, the black pools of the Twin Towers also connect these two places by having the azimuth to Uluru at an exact 45 degree angle diagonal that runs to Dallas. Recall that the projected geometry of the footprints of the tower set up a parallelogram that is aligned with Mount Everest's hexagonal geometry. 
A clue that this arrangement may not be accidental lies in the fact that the Masonic obelisk, known as Cleopatra's Needle, sits at the center of an octagon in Central Park that is within one degree of being oriented to Mount Everest. Incidentally, it is also 1.3 degrees off being aligned with Mount Rushmore. This ancient Egyptian obelisk is the only one in North America. It was moved here and erected by Freemasons in 1881 in grand ceremony. According to the New York Post, at least 9,000 Freemasons marched up Fifth Avenue to commemorate the laying of the cornerstone. It is one of a pair, the other being in London, that of course has important geomancy that we'll examine in a bit. I draw attention to this obelisk because a line to it from 9-11 is exactly 90 degrees to a line to Uluru from the southwest corner of the Freedom Tower. The Freedom Tower was built after the Twin Towers fall and it expresses a perfect octagon in its design at Mid Tower. Zooming out, you can see that this line passes just a few meters east of the front doors of the Grand Masonic Lodge in New York and through the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. The lodge is exactly halfway between the Masonic Cleopatra's Needle and the Holocaust Museum. Move this line by 20 meters to see that the hexagonal part of the museum is aligned to Masonic Cleopatra's Needle. This alignment is not without precedent as the hexagonal part of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. appears to be aligned with the Masonic George Washington Monument. Revisiting the parallelogram once more, but this time remembering that it is also aligned with the Statue of Liberty's torch and Auschwitz. This connection from the plaza begs the question of whether Auschwitz is connected to Uluru, and indeed it is. The iconic train tracks where the Holocaust trains were brought through the Death Gate are aligned with Uluru. Remember, too, that the Death Gate is aligned with the Dome of the Rock and Masonic Mount Mushmore. The New York Obelisk is part of a pair that originally stood together in Heliopolis in ancient Egypt. In about 12 BC, the Romans moved them to Alexandria, where they were erected in the Caesarium before they were later toppled and buried in sand. The other of the pair was moved to London by Freemasons and erected in 1878. The London Needle is 3,333 kilometers from where they were staged in Alexandria. A line from Stonehenge to Mount Everest passes 666 meters from this London Needle. The famous London Eye Ferris Wheel happens to be at an exact 66.66 .66 degree to this line, as is the Palace of Westminster, more commonly known as England's Houses of Parliament across the river. The current palace was designed by Freemason architect Sir Charles Barry and building started in 1840. Part of the new palace's area was reclaimed from the Thames, which is the setting of its nearly 300 meter long riverfront where you can better see the 66.66 .66 degree angle expressed. The Stonehenge to Mount Everest line continues on to Uluru, where it lands at a five point between it and Katajuta. Mount Everest is almost exactly halfway between Stonehenge and this point. Bring in the line from the New York Needle and you can see that they are nearly perpendicular off by 1.4 degrees. Part of the Stonehenge to Uluru line ends up serving as a leg to what I call a world pentagram that is exactly centered on the Peace Pyramid in Astana, Kazakhstan. There are a number of these world pentagrams that are all sized by taking a Masonic clue and setting the distance between apexes to be exactly 3,333 kilometers, which is one twelfth of the Earth's polar circumference. Their position is then set by important human and physical geography. In this case, you can see how centering the pentagram on the Peace Beard and aligning with Stonehenge puts Mount Everest at an apex. The Peace Pyramid in Astana, Kazakhstan was purpose-built to serve as a meeting place for all the world's religions once every three years. It is lined up with the Pyramids of Giza Plateau 
and with the deepest part of Lake Bacal, the deepest lake on Earth by a wide margin. This lake is thought to be 35 million years old, and it contains 20% of the world's unfrozen fresh water. The Peace Pyramid is also close to being at a golden ratio of five point between the Great Pyramid and Lake Bacal, within 20 kilometers, or 99.8%. Another example of a world pentagram sits in the North Pacific where two long chains of volcanic islands follow pentagonal geometry. One flowing from Mauna Loa, the largest volcano on Earth. The Northwest Lake runs directly through the intersection of the Kuril, Kamchatka and Aleutian trenches. This pentagram is independently positioned by the human geography of the Great Pyramid and the Masonic International Peace Garden on the border between Canada and the United States. Not only are there two openly Masonic buildings in the garden, but the one that seats 2,000 people depicts a giant compass and square. The other building stewarded by the Masons is the Order of the Eastern Star Peace Chapel built right on the border between Canada and the United States. Order of the Eastern Star is a Freemasonic appendant body open to both men who are master masons and women who have specific relationships with masons. Incredibly, the International Peace Garden has not one but two 9-11 memorials. The outdoor memorial is composed of a jumble of beams that are actually from Ground Zero, while the indoor memorial is in the Masonic Peace Chapel centered around a book with all the victims' names lying open in ritual. The central feature of the garden is an octagonal pool. Taking an azimuth from here to the center of the Pacific pentagram shows that it is exactly 288 degrees from true north, or 18 degrees north of the Canada-US border. This angle fits a pentagram overlaid on the garden. Perhaps this alignment to the Pacific world pentagram is known by the designers of the garden. As drawn, the pentagram is 1,618 feet between apexes, or the golden number times 1,000. Sizing it this way aligns it with the garden's most prominent features. With amazing precision, the other two bisectors, laid out to an accuracy of a hundredth of a degree, run exactly to the Great Pyramid and to the end of our Peace Pyramid golden racial line at Lake Bacal. Projecting out five great circles that form the Pacific pentagram, we can see that one of them passes within 20 kilometers of the Peace Pyramid at the five point in the line. If you draw in the five great circles forming the pentagon around any of these world pentagrams, they form a larger pentagram. Rotate the globe, and you can see there are actually a series of pentagrams, 12 in total around the globe. Another way of viewing the geometry produced by these great circles is as an icosidodecahedron, one of the 13 Archimedean solids. Extend the Great Pyramid to Lake Bacal Golden Racial Line to a spot where Africa turns the corner at Cameroon. Set this point to be exactly 333 degrees map length from the Great Pyramid, and the Peace Pyramid then ends up being exactly 7,777.77 kilometers from that spot. Perhaps the pyramid's height being given as 77 meters is not an accident. Incidentally, this configuration also places the end of the golden racial line at 5,555 nautical miles to 99.96% accuracy. Consider that the slope angle of the Great Pyramid has been calculated to be 51 degrees 51 minutes, which agrees with the angle of the few casing stones remaining at its base. Start with our line precisely defined by the Giza Pyramids and the Peace Pyramid in Astana. Create a line from the Cameroon point of exactly 44 degree map length following at the precise Great Pyramid angle of 51 degrees 51 minutes. Extend the line through Cameroon in the opposite direction by the same 44 degree map length and the, repeat the process of sweeping out a Great Pyramid angle until it intersects the other line running through the Great Pyramid, which we have also extended. Africa's physical geography corresponds. Move around the globe to see that this extension passes close to the famous pyramids of Teotihuacan, and that much of the east coast of continental geography of North America lines up. 
Teotihuacan is the site of many of the most architecturally significant Mesoamerican pyramids built in the pre-Columbian Americas. Its Pyramid of the Sun is the third largest in the world after the Great Pyramid of Kalua and the Great Pyramid of Giza. Looking from above, the Pyramid of the Sun has the same base area as the Great Pyramid. Using this as a cue, overlay all the pyramids from the Giza Plateau at the same scale. Mark each pyramid with a square for clarity and remove the Giza overlay. Drawing in a center line down the Avenue of the Dead shows the alignment of the Khafre Pyramid. Drawing a perpendicular from the center of the altar in the Plaza of the Moon, Makari Pyramid Center is aligned. In early July 2017, it was reported that a 10 meter deep tunnel runs from under the Pyramid of the Moon to the central altar indicating its importance. It's worth noting that human remains found at this site indicate it was the main site used for human sacrifice in the Teotihuacan complex. Were the masons that built the pyramids here aware of the pyramids of the Giza Plateau in 100 AD? Zooming out shows the extension from the Great Pyramid passing just over 20 kilometers from the Pyramid of the Sun. Now recall that the Stonehenge to George Washington Masonic Memorial alignment, with all of its associated 33s, and extend it through the area. It too passes close to Teotihuacan. Incredibly, this line comes exactly 33.33 kilometers from the entrance to the Pyramid of the Sun at a point exactly 8,800 kilometers from Stonehenge. The Great Pyramid Line, which originally had us take a look at Teotihuacan, passes through the exact golden ratio point between the Pyramid of the Sun and the point where the Masonic Stonehenge line is tangent at 33.33 kilometers. A bit more continental weirdness exists relating to this framework we've created. First draw a circle exactly 666 nautical mile radius on the midpoint of the 44 degree map length that runs northwest of Cameroon. Next, create a second circle of the same size that the Vesica Pisces created between the two is aligned with the Statue of Liberty. A long stretch of West African coastline follows this second circle. This 666 nautical mile radius circle fits world scale geography not just in Africa but in many spots around the world where features line up on all continents. Furthermore, human geography also resonates with this distance. The Dome of the Rock, the most sacred spot in Judaism, is this distance to the Kaaba in Mecca, the most sacred spot in Islam. Extend our line from Cameroon, but this time to the northwest until it reaches a point where a line to the Masonic Cleopatra's Needle in New York City lies in an exact Great Pyramid angle from our Cameroon line. It passes directly through the giant Mount Logan, the tallest mountain in Canada and the second tallest in North America, forming a crossroad with a line from Machu Picchu. It then continues to within three kilometers of Mount St. Elias, the second tallest mountain in Canada and the U.S., because it sits right on the border. Mount Logan is a massive mountain with what is thought to be the largest base circumference of any mountain on Earth. This region is also the most glaciated in all of North America. Continue this trend one more time and see that resulting line passes through the tip of the Baja Peninsula by the famous Cabo San Lucas. A line from the Great Pyramid through Stonehenge intersects this line exactly where it leaves the North American bedrock. Follow this along in the opposite direction from Baja, it circles back to Lake Bacal and intersects the Great Pyramid to Peace Pyramid line. This intersection, set up by repeating digits and the slope angle of the Great Pyramid, occupies a very special geomantic location that ties together the whole tale back to the Vatican. This precise confluence in the deepest lake in the world is the exact same distance from the famous 4-meter Pinga pine cone statue at the Vatican as is the tallest mountain, Mount Everest. This massive pine cone originally stood in front of the Temple of Isis in company of all those ancient obelisks. 
The angle between these two azimuths is only 0 0.36 degrees off that of the Masonic Washington Monument Pyramidal. Thinking of waters expressing the feminine and rock the masculine, a Masonic angle between the most extreme examples on Earth makes sense considering the duality that plays out in Freemason symbolism. Consider that a line to Mount Everest, which has hexagonal bedrock geometry, passes within 30 meters of the anchoring apex of the Rome hexagon we've developed. As we've seen, this hexagon played an anchoring role in the other Washington Monument pyramidal we saw defined by the geomancy. The two pyramidals are further tied because the enigmatic pigna that serves as the apex of one originally sat in front of the Temple of Isis, which you've already seen on the bisector of the other pyramidal. My name is Kevin McMahon and I have a terminal illness that will likely have taken me by the time you see this video. I believe the information I presented here is very important and I have not seen it published elsewhere. I have a request that you share this information if you agree and ideally you download a copy from hornbyislandmystery.com and host it on your own channel. But any sharing is good of course. I also have a Google Earth data file that uh, contains all the lines, overlays, points that I have in this video so that you can confirm the work for yourself. And that is also available on hornbyislandmystery.com. Thank you for watching.